The Haunted Mind by Nathaniel Hawthorne. In the depths of every heart, there is a taunt and a dungeon. Though the lights, the music, and revelry above may cause us to forget their existence, and the very ones, our prisoner whom they hide, but sometimes, and soft nights at midnight, those dark receptacles are flung wide open. What a singular moment is the first one when you have hardly begun to recollect yourself. After starting from midnight slumber, by uncrossing your eyes, so suddenly you seem to have surprised the personages of your dream in full convocation round your bed and catch one broad glance at them before they can fill into obscurity. Or, to vary the metaphor, you find yourself for a single instant wide awake in that dream of illusions, with a sleeve has been the passport, and behold its ghostly inhabitants and wondrous scenery with a perceptions of their strangeness such as you never attained while the dream is undisturbed. The distant sounds of a church clock is borne faintly on the wind. You question with yourself, half seriously, whether it has stolen to your waking ear from some grey tower that stood within the precincts of your dream, while yet in suspense, another clock flings its heavy clanks over the slumbering town, with so full and distinct a sound, and such a long murmur in the neighboring air, that you are certain it must proceed from the steeple at the nearest corner. You count the strokes, one, two, and three. They kiss with a booming sound like the gatherings of a first stroke within the belt. If you could choose an hour of wakefulness out of the whole night, it would be this. Since your sober bed timed at eleven, you have had rest enough to take off the pressures of yesterday's bad gift. While before you, till the sun comes from far Cathy, to brighten your window, there is almost the space of a summer night, one hour to be spent in thought with the mice eyes half shut, and two in present dreams, and two in that strangest of enjoyments, the forgetfulness alike of joys and woe. The moment of rising belongs to another period of time and appear so distant that the plunks out of a warm bed into the frosty air cannot yet be anticipated with dismay. Yesterday has already vanished among the shadows of the past. Tomorrow has not yet emerged from the future. You have found an intermediate space where the business of life does not intrude where the passing moment lingers and becomes truly the present, a spot where father timed, when he thinks nobody is watching him, sits down by the wayside to take breath. Oh, that he would fall asleep and let mortal life on without growing older. Hitherto you have lain perfectly still, because the slightest motion would dissipate the fragments of your slumber. Now, being irrevocably awake, you peep through the half drawn window curtain and observe that the grass is ornamented with fanciful devices in frost work, and that each paint presents something like a frozen dream. There will be time enough to trash out the analogy while waiting the summons to breakfast. Seen through the clear portions of the, of the grass, 
feathers lively, mountain peaks of the frost scenery do not ascend. The most conspicuous object is the steeple, the white spire of which directs you to the winterized pressure of the firmament. You may almost distinguish the figures on the clock that has just told the hour. Such a frosty sky and the snow-covered roofs and the long vista of the frozen street are white. And the distant water hardened into rock might make you shovel even under full blankets and woolen comfort too. Yet, look at that one glorious start. Its beams are distinguishable from all the rest and actually cast the shadow of the casements on the bed with a radiance of deeper hue than moonlight, though not so accurate and outline. You sink down and muffle your head in the clothes, shivering all the world, but less from bodily chill than the bare idea of a polar atmosphere. It is too cold even for the thought to venture abroad. You speculate on the luxury of wearing out a whole existence in bed, like an oyster in its shell, content with the sluggish ecstasy of inaction, and drowsily conscious of nothing but delicious warmth such as you now feel again. Ah. That idea has brought a hideous response in its trend. You think how the dead are lying in their cold shells and narrow coffin to the real winter of the grave, and cannot presuppose your fancy that they neither shrink nor shiver when the snow is drifting over their little hill rocks and bitter brass house against the door of the tomb. That gloomy thought will correct a gloomy multitude and draw its complexions over your wakeful hour. In the depths of every heart, there is a tomb and a dungeon. Though the lights, the music and reverie above may cause us to forget their existence and the bullying ones are prisoners whom they hide. But sometimes, and oftenest at midnight, those dark receptacles are flung wide open. In an hour like this, when the mind has a passive sensibility but no active strength, when the imagination is a mirror imparting vividness to our ideas without the powers of selecting or controlling them. Then pray that your griefs may slumber and the brotherhood of remorse not break the chain. It is too late. Ephemeral trains comes gliding by your bed in which passion and freely assume bodily shape, and things of the mind become dim, spectrous to the eye. That is your earliest sorrow, a pale young mourner wearing a sister's likeness to first love, sadly beautiful, with a hollow sweetness in her melancholy faces and grace in the floor of her several robe. Next appears a chest of rural loveliness, with dust among her golden hair and her bright garments, all faded and defaced, stealing from your glance with drooping head, as fearful of reproach. She was your fondest hope, but a deal seized one, so call her disappointment now. A stunner from succeeds with a brow of wrinkles, a look and gestures of iron authority. There is no name from him unless it be fatality. An embell of the event influence that rule your fortunes. 
a demon to whom you subjected yourself by some error at the outset of life, and will bow his slave forever by once obeying him. See the offended little men scribbling on the dark nets, the world's leaf of scorn, the mockery of that living eye, the pointed finger touching the sore place in your heart. Do you remember any act of animus folly at which you would brush even in the remotest cavern of the earth? Then recognize your shame. Past, rich band, well for the wakeful one, if righteously miserable, a fiercer tribe do not surround him. The devils of a guilty heart that hold its hell within itself. What if remorse should assume the feathers of an injured friend? What if the friendships come in women's garments with a pale beauty, a missing and desolation, and lie down by your side? What if he should stand at your base foot in the likeness of a corpse with a bloody stain upon the child? Sufficient without such guilt is this nightmare of the soul, this heavy, heavy singing of the spirits, this wintry gloom about the heart, this indistinct horror of the mind blending itself with the darkness of the chamber. By a desperate effort, you start upright, breaking from a source of conscious sleep and gazing wildly round the beds, as if the fiends were anywhere but in your haunted mind. At the same moment, the slumber embers on the heart sent forth, a gleam which palely illuminates the whole outer room and flickers through the door of the bedchamber, but cannot quite dispel its obscurity. Your eyes searches for whatever may remind you of the living world with eager minutes. You take notes of the table near the fireplace, the book with an ivory knife between its leaves, the unfolded letter, the hat and the falling gloves. Soon the frame vanishes and with it the whole scene is gone. Gold is image remains an instant in your mind's eye when darkness has swallowed the reality throughout the chamber that is the same obscurity as before, but not the same gloom within your breast. As your head falls back upon the pillow, you think in a whisper be is spoken. How present in this night nice solitudes would be the rise and falls of a softer breathing than your own. Thus lie precious of a tenderer bosom, the quiet throat of poorer heart, imparting its peacefulness to your troubled wand, as if the false sleeper were involving you in her dream. Her inspiration is over you, though she have no existence but in that momentary image. You sink down in a flowery spot on the borders of sleep and wakefulness, while your thoughts rise before you in pictures all disconnected, yet are assimilated by a poverty, gladsomeness, and beauty. The building of gorgeous squadrons that glitter in the sun is succeeded by the monuments of children round the door of a schoolhouse, beneath the glimmering shadow of old trees at the corner of a rustic lane. You stand in the sunny rains of a summer shower and wander among the sunny trees of autumnal wood and look upward at the brightest of all rainbows, overarching the unbroken sheet of snow on the American sides of Niagara. 
your mind starts goes precisely between the dancing radiance around the heart of a young man and his recent bride, and the twittering flights of birds in spring about their new made nest. You feel the merry boundings of a ship before the breeze, and watch the tuneful feet of rosy gold as they twine their last and merest dance in a splendid ballroom and find set in the billion circles of a crowded theater as the curtain falls over a light and every scene. With an involuntary start, you seize hold on consciousness and prove yourself but half awake by running doubtful parallel between human life and the hour which has now elapsed. In both you emerge from mystery, pass through a vicissitude that you can but imperfectly control, and are born on what to another mystery. Now comes the peals of distant clock, with fainter and fainter strokes as you plunge farther into the wilderness of sleep. It is the need of a temporary death. Your spirit has departed and strays like a free citizen among the peoples of shadow we world, beholding strange sights, yet without wonder or dismay. So, crime perhaps will be the final shame, so undisturbed, as if among familiar things the entrance of the soul to its eternal home.